Hi. So I'm enjoying these. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny to to uh, look at some of the older ones that are now on, on the YouTube channel that I have. I did them well, like six years ago, something like that, and to just feel who I am now and who I was then. You know, there's no end to this journey. There's no place to get to. There's no, you know, I know in the early days when I heard seven years, it was like my mind had such an idea of what that would mean. I would get to seven years and then I would. No, you just keep going, you know, because we're alive. So we just keep moving in our lives. So, you know, for people who think uh, seven years is a long time or like sometimes I'll say I've been in the experiment for 18, 19 who cares, really? I mean, if you're living as yourself, you're present in the moment, and it doesn't matter how many years or, um, yeah. Anyway, but we do keep uh, we do keep evolving. We become more of who we are, and uh, yeah. Anyway, it was kind of fun to see these old video clips that are, that are there on the channel now. Um, today I wanted to talk about the mind and not the mind the way I learned the mind in human design which was about the Ajna center and the head center and the gates and the channels surrounding that. But I wanted to share with you what I've come to see about the mind. Um, from living my own experiment, from my past with, um, you know, traveling to India, sitting with some amazing teachers. Um, the hardest thing, aside from waiting with um, my experiment in the early days, was the, how my mind tortured me. I mean, it really tortured me. Uh, it was telling me if I went, uh, uh, oh, you should do this, you're going to miss something, how can you say no to that, on and on. And if I went, you know, um, whatever I responded to, it told me the opposite. And it was very, very hard to live with that, huh? Because... I was left alone with my own mind. No one was in the experiment, and most people were just learning human design. So, of course, you know, uh, the mind is a great tool if you're learning human design. You know, it puts the mind to use. And yes, I was responding to taking classes, and so there was this, you know, investigation of my own chart and the charts of my family members, and my mind was used there. But uh, what my mind did to me, you know, because it had had the power my whole life. Um, it really ran my life. So what I started to, when I started to work with people, was um, something I learned for myself was don't believe anything that your mind says to you. Don't believe anything that your mind says to you about you, about your life, about who's in your life, about what you should do, when you should do it, how you should do it, and all of that. Don't believe it. it took me a long time to get there. And, um, it was realizing that I could not really believe anything my mind said to me because I could see from my own response that it was opposite to what my mind was telling me I should do and I knew that I had been listening to that mind my whole life and that mind was running the show. So um, for me, the biggest thing is to not believe what your mind is saying. In, in the 
Eastern spirituality that I was involved in, there was a lot of drop your mind, you know, just drop your mind. Well, <laughs> who's going to drop the mind, huh? I mean, what's going to drop the mind? What I got to see for myself is the mind is going to talk. It's just going to talk. If you have a defined mind, most of the time, it always is talking about something. You've got a street, and it's going up and down that street, whatever that channel definition is. If you have an open mind like I do, once in a while there may be periods of no thinking happening. But there's no way that the mind is just going to stop thinking. It has a job. The mind has a job. So rather than trying to get rid of the mind, because that's impossible, it's about not being interested, not believing what the mind is telling you about you. Because this is where the suffering comes in. This is where, you know, um, the torture chamber is <laughs> our own mind and it's um you know something happens in your life something happens and in that moment the body can feel uncomfortable there can be some emotional movement happening if you're an emotional being you can have an intuitive hit about something in that moment and all of that can be true about that moment. But then the mind comes in. Oh, you should have said that. And you know, that person and they, and, and it makes up a whole story about that one moment. And in making up a story about that moment, it's hooked you. And then it feeds the story. And, you know, whether it's a good story or a bad story, it's still a story. It's just something that the mind is making up about what is. And so um, one of the things that uh, I do in the immersion work that I do is everyone gets a journal. And part of the journal are for insights and what you see, what you understand about yourself. But a big part of it is about really getting to see one's own mind. So um, rather than I'm terrible or I should have done this or I'm wonderful, it doesn't matter because it's both sides. Remember the angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other, the good or the bad, that's all the mind. Is um, to write, I mean, and it helps, I really do. You don't have to have a journal, but to have some paper. To write it out, my mind thinks I should have done this. My mind thinks I'm terrible. My mind thinks, you know, to get it out of the I, because that then we associate with who we are when we say I and put it over there where it belongs. It's the mind thinking. It's not your awareness. The awareness is the passenger in the back seat that's witnessing, that's looking out, just seeing. But this mind has a story about what it's seeing. The mind has a story about everything. And what has been really fascinating for me is, is is hearing from people after they've been doing this for a while that the mind tells the same thing over and over again. It's got a few stories and it changes maybe a few little details, but it runs the same stories over and over. And I'm not good enough. You know, you just have to look at open centers just to look at the open centers and what the mind does with the open centers. And I'm not going to go into that there. There's books and everybody talks. So no, this is, this is my sharing with you about what I see. But you'll see the same patterns, the same patterns over and over again. Because, you know, the mind is like a, a huge computer that has stored everything about your life 
colored it as well. It's not just stored it like the exact um, picture of what happened, the imprint of what happened. It's flavored it all, okay? Because the mind always flavors and colors and puts slants on things. It never really just sees because the mind can't do that. That's, that's the consciousness does that. The mind doesn't. So the, the, um, the, uh, it's stored all of that, okay? So there's the mind with the whole past. So the way I lived before I started with living as a generator and making sounds to make my decisions is there would be something I wanted to do. So then I would think about the past and then decide if I would do that, what I was thinking about what I wanted to do. So in a way, it perpetuated the old patterns, the same patterns over and over because it's pulling from the past and then putting it into the future and then you would jump over now, <laughs> go from the past to the future because the mind cannot exist in the now. It's the only place the mind can exist is now. You can only be present now. Only present now. in the isness of what is. And I don't mean that in like a spiritual sense. It just means you're just in your life as it is, having a cup of coffee, watching TV, talking with a friend. The mind can exist in the now. So when we get these strategies, it's a way to break these patterns. Because I don't know about you, but I never waited. I never waited in my life. I was, you know, too busy wanting what I wanted and then trying to make what that happen. So waiting, that was a real killer. That broke a pattern. And then having my inner authority decide yes or no, not my mind, but that place inside of me, which for me it's the sacral sounds, but everyone, you know, doesn't have that. There is a place within that has a yes or no. And um, it's not the mind. The mind is never the inner authority. And um, so you, you get a chance to buy the strategy just the strategy alone, because while you're waiting, and almost everyone has to wait, while you're waiting, you don't think the mind's quiet. You know, <laughs> the mind is not quiet. It's got a thousand stories. What are you going to wait? How are you going to pay the bills? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, it's got everything. And it feeds on fear. It feeds on insecurity. It feeds on our uh, places of, of vulnerability. It feeds on that because it knows, it knows, it knows how it's gotten us. You know, however old we are, that's how many years it knows. It's, it's learned where those points are. I mean, it took me years for, for me to relax when my mind would start to have things to say about my daughter and my grandchildren. You know, if there was anything going on in their life, you know, where I might worry, the mind feeds, the mind worries, the mind worries. So the mind would start worrying and I could, in the early days, get caught up in that worrying. And then it would take, you know, I, I knew that there was nothing to do that I needed to respond, but still the mind was worrying. You know, the mind worries, it just does. But not to believe those, what it's saying about that. So it took a long time and now, you know, I can know things are going on in my grandkids' life or my daughter's life or any family member. And the mind kind of whispers a little worry because it can't get me like it used to. It just, what happens is the the threads 
that threads that connected the mind to my life got thinner and thinner. Where before, when I first began, my mind was my life. And then slowly, you know, it, it has to know its place because, again, the mind's not a bad guy. It's beautiful. I love sharing with others. Not about me, but about what I see and how things could happen and out there. The mind is of tremendous use and beautiful, but it just is. It's not to be turned against us. So the, 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 the starting to uh, say my mind, you know, like, if I can think of an example. Hmm. Well, the last thing that it tried to get was about losing weight for me. Okay, this has been a lot, a lot, a lot of years. So rather than me saying, I need to lose weight, to change it to my mind thinks I need to lose weight. And if someone asks me and I go, mm-hmm, then yes. Or if I go, mm-mm, then it's no. But until that moment, I don't know. And the mind does not want to live in not knowing. The mind hates not knowing. That's why it's always trying to sort things out. It, it has to know. So well, what are you going to do? And how are you going to pay for that that's three months away? And how are you going to have your life if you don't do this? And, you know, it has to know. So it's always trying to figure it out and then see how it's going to get to what it thinks it should get to. Because the mind hates not knowing. And for me, what I love is really living in not knowing. Because it's the truth. It's the truth. I know the past. I'm here now. And from here forward, I don't know. I don't know. And this is the truth for all of us. We really don't know. You know, yeah, you can have your whole agenda planned for a year in advance, but who knows? We just don't know. And to relax in that not knowing. And for me, having an open mind, you know, part of having an open mind is that you don't want anyone to know you don't know. <laughs> because they could think you're stupid. You don't want anyone to think you're stupid. I don't care. You know, I just, I don't know. And to live in that, and you sink into not knowing. And it's so relaxing, because it's not up here living life. It's living life really here. You know, and it's not just the body that lives the life. It's the passenger in the back seat. It's a marriage, you know? And the only way to get to that sacred space that I know that worked for me is, was through strategy, you know, by not initiating anymore was a way for the mind to not be in control of my life and for my passenger to really realize it's sitting in the back seat, it's not driving. Because the mind has been telling the passenger it's the driver all these years. It's not the driver. The driver and the, the vehicle have, you know, they come in together. They're a couple. But this, this, this amazing place of, of the, the soulmates within, the soulmates within, this is when the passenger and the driver and the vehicle all work well, they don't even work. It's more like they are together and there's no friction and there's not a fight and there's not, you know, it's just perfect communion within, within. It's an amazing experience and there's no way for that communion to happen when the mind is believed. 
Because if you believe the mind, there's no communion. You can't relax. The mind doesn't want you to relax. You know, the mind wants to keep control, to keep the power. So it keeps you always like, oh, what if? And oh my God, and you know, all that, all that. It's all. And this is like, wow, this is, this is where life is. So this beautiful communion that happens within, and it's only when the communion has happened within can you really commune with another human being. You know, it's, it's this, this song is being sung. We each have our own song. There's music within each of this, this whole thing that's happening here. It's music and it just, you know, gets more and more and more refined and it becomes more beautiful. And it's a unique song that everyone sings. And then you, you, you live from that space and you meet another person who has a unique song. And then the songs blend in like a harmony or a, you know, they, it's beautiful music together, but you can't do that until, you know, this marriage within has happened and it can't happen with the mind running the show. It just can't. So it's not about getting rid of the mind because, you know, I have a lot of space in my life where the mind doesn't talk has nothing much to say about me. You know, I mean, I have discussions with people and coffees with people. We talk about other things, but there's a lot of space in my life where my mind doesn't have much to say about my life. But I know it's over there, <laughs> just waiting. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't disappear. But when it you know, when you no longer give it the power and you don't believe it, it knows its place. And then you get to really relax in the back seat. Live your life. Live your life. It's your life. This is my life. It's the joy of, of being in form is to be able to live this. And, uh, you know, Ross had said early on, it's our birthright, it's our birthright to live the essence of who we were born to be. And uh, the mind doesn't have a part of that. It's uh, not as far as guiding this. You know, it has its it play with others. Minds can make love. It's really, it's really amazing, the beauty of the mind in its right place. But um, it's our birthright to really live this. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. So, um, well, that's all for today. <laughs> Bye.